Welcome to Incarnation. Welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us on Zoom and those who are here in the sanctuary. It's good to be together this morning. Um, just a few notes before we begin. The children do worship in the service with us. So we have a space back here called the True Vine Atrium for children seven to 12, um, or materials for them to use as they sit with their families in the service. We have a little nook for children under three. And then we have our Good Shepherd Atrium for children ages three to six back in this area of the room. So if you have children that would like to engage with the materials for formation in any of those spaces, you're welcome to accompany um, them there. And for the rest of us, we just enjoy hearing the sound of their feet, the sound of their voices as we worship together. There are restrooms in this corner of the gym and also down the hall. That's also where water fountains can be found. Um, and everything you'll need is on these printed liturgies. So hopefully you grab one when you came in, and if you didn't, you will need one. Uh, so let's just take a moment to take a deep breath, have your liturgy in hand, and then we'll begin our worship together. I invite you to stand. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, Let's pray together for our hearts. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let's sing. God be merciful to me, on thy grace I rest my plea, plant just in compassion love, blot out my transgressions now, wash me
You govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 
And now's the time in our service where we pray for our kids. So I invite you to extend a hand toward a kid near you or a kid on the Zoom screen near you, and we'll pray for these children. Thank you, Father, for the voices of our children in worship and in play and in prayer. Thank you for their presence with us and for all that they have to teach us. Lord, we pray that you would bless them, that you would strengthen them, that you would build your faith into them and that you would guide them as their good shepherd. And we pray also, Lord, for your blessing on the children of Randolph Elementary, that you would support and protect and uphold them, that they would come to know you and walk with you as their good shepherd. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now let's sing with our kids. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and reading from Jeremiah, chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our rebellions indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot get help? Yet you, O oh Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning his people. Truly, they have loved to wander. They have not retained, restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity punish their sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please join me in praying Psalm 84. How lovely are your dwellings, O Lord God of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing to enter into the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. Indeed, the sparrow has found her a house, and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they who dwell in your house. They will be always praising you. Blessed is the one whose strength is in you and whose heart are your ways. Through the going through the valley of misery, this is it for a while. Indeed, the early rains fill the pools with water. They will go from strength to strength, and the Lord of God shall be seen by them in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer, hearken, O God of Jacob. Behold, O God our defender, and look upon your face, your anointing. For one, one day in your course is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the populace. For the, the Lord, Lord God is the light in the tents. The Lord will give grace and honor, and no good thing shall be withhold from those who live by our love. O the Lord God of hosts, blessed is the one who puts his trust in you. A reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, to chapter 4, verse 5. I, Paul, hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you so that if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church, the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Without any doubt, 
the mystery of godliness is great. It was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will renounce the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They forbid marriage and abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God create, created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected, provided it is received with thanksgiving or it is sanctified by God's word and by prayer. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm one of the pastors here at Incarnation. Uh, and I wanted to start off, thanks to my family for bringing my color printouts, but um, I don't know how well you can see this, but does anyone know what this is a picture of? You can just yell it out. Yard signs, yeah, these are yard signs. Yard signs you have probably seen all over the place. Um, and does anyone know, even without being able to read it, what the first line of these yard signs is? If you do, just call it out. In this house? In this house, we believe, that's right. Yes, so there are some variations that I've brought on these signs. Um, but yes, in this house, we believe Black Lives Matter, science is real, water is life, kindness is everything, etc., cetera, et cetera. And we see these signs, these in this house we believe signs, all over my neighborhood, which is a few blocks from here, and really just all over the place. But earlier this summer, I read an article in the Washington Post about how a sort of passive aggressive uh, sign fight had erupted in Alexandria City. So it started with, this is actually a picture from the article, with kind of the original, in this house we believe, someone put it in their front yard, as people do. And then the next door neighbors, these were townhomes, put up a different sign that says, in this house we believe simplistic platitudes, trite tautologies, and semantically overloaded aphorisms are poor substitutes for respectful and rational discussions about complex issues. <laughs> then, kind of, this argument took on a life of its own. And these signs started to appear in people's yards that no one had put there. So the next one that cropped up said, 
In this house, we believe that using snark and sarcasm and pedantic, overly complex language to respond to others' somewhat meaningless virtue signaling is just divisive and trollish behavior, but hey, signs are fun. And then, it really went to the next level, and no one knows where this came from, but these signs started to crop up in all sorts of people's yards, which say, we believe the legal thriller Michael Clayton, starring George Clooney, Tilda Swinton, and Tom Wilkinson, is a vastly underrated cinematic masterpiece and easily one of the five best films of the 21st century. <laughs> I love the amen over here. <laughs> that gets us the gist of it, right? So, I do not condone this sort of proxy fighting with your neighbors at all, but I do think this phenomena of yard signs, of competing yard signs, of yard signs that are trying to tell you something, are actually getting at something significant, something that is actually true underneath all of the aphorisms. Because what we believe ought to shape what kind of household we are. It ought to shape what kinds of people live in this household and how they behave. And today's passage from 1 Timothy functions like that. It's like an in this house we believe statement, but it's for the household of God. And this one is not at all a simplistic platitude. It is profound. It's full of power. It can transform and shape our whole way of life our whole way of making choices as we move through the world. But Paul essentially says, in this house, we believe Jesus Christ was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, and taken up in glory. And this, in this house, we believe, this is the heart of First Timothy. This is the pinnacle of the letter. It's like a hinge point. Everything that comes before has pointed to it, and everything that comes after will flow out of it. So Paul begins this passage saying, I'm writing these instructions to you so that you may know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Now, I've actually already quoted that uh, passage in the very first sermon in this series, because I said then, and I'll say it again, that's kind of the summary of the point of this letter. Paul is writing to Timothy to communicate to this church in Ephesus so that they will know how to behave in the household of God. And 1 Timothy is a really behavior-oriented letter, and we've heard a lot of behavior instructions. We've heard about qualifications for church leaders, roles for men and women, how to pray for civic authorities, how to distinguish between good and bad teaching. And as we read through 1 Timothy, and we have a few more weeks in this book, all of these instructions for behavior can start to sound a little bit tedious. Perhaps like Paul is just a little bit too obsessed with how people behave and what the rules are and order in this household. And it actually sounds really different in 1 Timothy than the rest of Paul's letters. This Paul who's had this really liberating, life-changing experience with Jesus and who's always preaching grace and freedom, not so much rules and behavior. And it sounds different from the Jesus we encounter in the Gospels, like in today's parable where you see this tax collector, this flagrant sinner who receives so much mercy while the righteous rule follower, good behavior, goes home empty-handed. So how do we make sense of Paul's repeated emphasis on behavior in this letter? Well, we first can look to the bigger context of the letter. We've talked a little bit about this, but First Timothy was written near the end of Paul's life and ministry. And this Jesus movement that Paul himself was a part of and that he had helped spread so far it was really beginning to take root, to take shape. The followers of Jesus had started to develop some structures. They had started to develop some norms, some ways of doing things, some shared ways of talking about things. 
the church that Paul is talking to in 1 Timothy is a church that is maturing. It's coming to grips with its place in society. And we can hear this sense in the text, how Paul calls it the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. This is language of temple, of solidity and permanence. First Timothy gives us a snapshot of the church that is moving from being a movement to being an institution. But as soon as I say that, I have to disclose that I have a bit of an anti-institutional streak in me. I come by this naturally. I was raised by hippies. They encouraged me to always think for myself and question authority and gave me a lot of independence. So I have this innate skepticism of institutions that makes me not really want to engage with the institutional nature of the church we see in this letter. I love the idea of movements of people, the weirdness and the messiness and the unpredictability of the earliest followers of Jesus. And we had a vestry day yesterday and one of our vestry members, Caitlin, uh, called our church-wide group WhatsApp chat, which you're all welcome to get in on, a virtual hippie commune. And my heart just soared. The anti-institutional piece of me just loved that. But I have seen enough in the church and in society, both here and around the world, to know that institutions, healthy institutions, are also how we take care of each other well. Institutions are how we make sure nobody falls through the cracks, how we make sure abuses of power and authority are held in check and brought to justice, how we mobilize people and resources when crisis hits. Healthy institutions show us a way of life that is peaceable and orderly and just and compassionate. And so it is good and it makes sense that Paul in this letter is really concerned that the church in Ephesus be a healthy institution, an institution that bears witness to the kingdom of God, one that doesn't do harm in the name of Jesus. And as the church takes shape, it really, really matters how people behave in the household of God. And that word behave is a word that Paul has actually used in some of those more freewheeling letters. He uses it a lot, it's sometimes translated differently, but it actually means something a lot bigger than just following a set of rules. It's a broader sense of a whole manner of living, a whole way of life, the whole shape and contour of how this faith gets lived out. One of the commentaries I was reading this week kept using this phrase, authentic Christian existence, as a substitute for behavior, and I love that. And so in the next verses, Paul calls this existence, this behavior, the mystery of godliness. Or a clearer way of translating that might be, the mystery from which true godliness springs. The behavior of Christians, this true godliness, this authentic Christian existence, it springs from a mystery, a thing that was once hidden and has now been revealed. This is Paul's in this house we believe moment. This is where he describes this mystery, this central reality at the heart of all Christian behavior. And Paul says that our behavior is patterned on God's behavior in Jesus. Listen. He was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, and taken up in glory. This is the mystery of godliness. This is what is communicated in the way we live, the way we behave. Our behavior is telling a story about what God has done. We are behaving that story out in the world. And this story, as Paul presents it here, has both this earthly dimension and this heavenly dimension to it. So in the earthly dimension, we hear God reveals himself in flesh. The creator makes himself known in creation, in the life and death and physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. 
And we hear that this Jesus will be proclaimed in all nations and cultures and ethnicities throughout the world, in every language, everywhere, to the ends of the earth. It has a geography to it. It has a cultural flavor to it. And then in the heavenly dimension, we hear that he's vindicated by the spirit. He's seen by angels. He's taken up in glory. Jesus' resurrection is this heavenly declaration that God has won, that death is defeated, that human flesh has been exalted to the realm of the spirit where the angels dwell. Jesus has opened the way for humanity to live with God forever in glory. And so what we see in this scripture is we see a God who presses in, who doesn't pull back, who doesn't in any way disdain his creation or human flesh or any race or any people, but instead he is always moving out in love to restore creation to himself, to reconcile heaven and earth, to knit back together what's been torn apart. This is the mystery of godliness. This is the wellspring that all of our behavior flows from. And this is our pattern for a way of being and acting in the world. God's behavior in Jesus. Well, I said earlier that this passage is like a hinge, that every instruction Paul's given feeds into it, and every instruction that follows is going to flow out of it. We're going to hear echoes and reverberations of this passage through the rest of the letter. Paul is going to talk a lot about godliness and what that looks like. And we start to hear the echoes in the very next verses, where Paul warns against these false teachers who are saying not to eat certain foods and not to get married, presumably not to have sexual relations. Paul takes this really seriously. He calls this a lie, hypocritical, and demonic. He says, this teaching is not from God, but from his enemy. This teaching comes from the realm of death and destruction. It might look like righteousness, but it's not. And listen to the reason he gives. They, these false teachers, forbid marriage and abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected, provided it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by God's word and by prayer. Paul has just given us this glorious vision where God doesn't reject what he has made, but he is restoring it to himself. And so we pattern our behavior on God's behavior. We don't shrink away from the creative world or from other people or the world and all the frailty of living in a human body. We move toward creation. We move toward our own createdness with gratitude. And we receive the things God has made, food and touch and human intimacy as these good gifts from God. We trust God moment by moment to help us use them for them to meet our needs. And we navigate all of the temptations and the struggles and the pains and the sorrows of life in a human body, life in a created world with this humble posture of saying, thank you, thank you. This posture of asking for what we need and for asking God to bless what we have. So in the end, we see that Paul's emphasis on behavior here is really just calling us to this deeper trust and this deeper participation in God's work in us and in God's work in the world. We move out into the world as people who are reconciled and reconciling. We move out, we don't shrink away, we enjoy the good gifts of creation, we say thank you. <clears throat> we want our churches to be full of people who behave like this. We want to be people who behave like this. We want our lives and our institutions to tell the truth about who we are 
about this household and what we believe. So I pray we would never reduce the household of God and what we believe to just empty platitudes, to things that look like righteousness, but are actually from the enemy. I pray that we would really learn how to behave in the household of God and that God's behavior in Jesus would be our pattern. We're gonna take a moment of silence as we usually do. And um, I wanna invite you on the cover of your liturgy is the image for the gospel this week, like we usually have. And it's the image of the righteous man and the tax collector from our gospel passage. And what I loved when I saw this is I actually can't tell which is which. And so I would invite you in the quiet to just ask God if maybe one of these postures is a posture he's inviting you to adopt toward him. Maybe in your attitude toward something he has made toward your own body, toward a relationship or a food or something in the creative world or some other behavior. And then whether kneeling or open-handed, I invite you to give God thanks and to ask for his blessing.
confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we pray together. Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you chose to take on flesh and live amongst us, embracing the mess and frailty and beauty and wonder of this world. 
Help us not shrink from embracing our humanity and creation, but to approach it all with thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our new Bishop-elect Chris Warner and all in church leadership, we pray also for our new vestry, thanking you for their willingness to serve our church. We pray also for our staff, Amy, Katie, Josie, Emily, David, and Quatley. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, for the communities and countries touched by violence and war, for those who are grieving and unsure of their loved one's safety, we ask for comfort and peace. For those who see no future, may you give them hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This week, we pray for the Philippines and for the flourishing of its people. We ask that you would guide their new president to govern justly, turning away from practices of violence and abuse of power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation and for those in authority and for all in public service, as the election approaches, show us what love and justice require from us in this season and triumph over suppression and other acts that seek to silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This week, we also pray for Larsh South Arlington. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful community. Bless all of the core members and assistants and continue to provide protection from illness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, both mental and physical, and for any other adversity. We pray especially for a healing and smooth recovery for Juliet's parents. And I also lift up my cousin Ollie as he fights RSV. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, first silently and then aloud together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. These words are from 1st Timothy. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I invite you to stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to greet one another with a word of peace.
together. Um, first of all, welcome if you are visiting with us. We have mugs, we have books of common prayer, we have um, these little blue cards that you can fill out so we know how to keep in touch with you. Um, and all of those are available out in the narthex, uh, out on the welcome table. Also, small groups have started. These groups are just sharing a meal and doing evening or midday prayer around the table. So you have not missed anything. You are welcome to go on our website and sign up for one. And I also just want to draw your attention to, we have different Zoom prayer groups that are meeting. Men are meeting at 7 a.m. on Zoom on Thursdays and women at 7 a.m. on Fridays. And then we also, for several years now, continue to have midday prayer on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon. And all of that is on the online worship page of our website. Um, it's just great to be together and pray all of those opportunities. Also, um, we have a baptism cohort for people who are interested in baptism or in baptism for their children, or just would like to meet other people who are going through that process, even if your children have already been baptized. So the first one will meet this coming Saturday, October 29th, and then there's one every month um, for four sessions. So you can talk to Josie or to Katie to learn more, and if you want to RSVP, you can email Katie. Um, and her emails on there. Also, All Saints is coming up on November 6th. We always have a time in that service of remembrance um, where we remember the names of people who have died in the past year as well as anyone that we are grieving. Um, and so if there is someone that is dear to you who has died in the past year since the last All Saints, um, send me their picture and their full name just so we know how to spell it and their relation to you and we will include them in our program for that day. Uh, and the deadline for that is next Sunday, so I'll remind you then too. We have an opportunity to volunteer with Restoration Immigration Legal Aid, which is one of our outreach partners. They work with asylum seekers um, offering free immigration legal aid. And we will be serving um, food at one of their clinics coming up. So if you are interested in being a part of this, I highly recommend that everyone in the church try this at least once. Um, you can both serve the food and if you have time, just sit and meet people and pray for the clinic as it's happening. Um, so let me know. Email Emily if you're interested in doing that. You can also talk to me and let me know um, that Emily's coordinating that. And then in just a minute, we will turn toward the table. And as we do, just a note on how we practice it here. Uh, the table is open to everyone who is baptized and following Jesus. The ushers will invite you forward. You can come with your hands open. Um, we'll have two stations. We also have gluten-free bread and wine available for anyone who needs it. So just ask your server. Doesn't matter which side you come to for that. Um, and if for any reason you don't want to receive communion today, we would love for you to come forward anyway. And you can just cross your arms over your chest uh, to let us know and pray a prayer blessing over you. So now as we turn toward the table, let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Oh, dear. 
yours is the yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is our right, our duty, and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. Forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. When we had sinned against you and became subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once and for all, that by his suffering and death he might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament to be made one body with him we may dwell with him and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, in which we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask in, uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Lamb of God, who take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who take away the sin of the world, 
have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul?
God to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All of our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes we set on the risen Christ. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you and have a great day.